blind people read and write. How can a pendulum save your life? How does a marionette puppet work? How can I make paper perform acrobatics? You use elastic and springs and things like that. Do yep. I? Yeah, paper trampolines, that's what it is. You're going to make one. Much simpler than that. Right. How can I write a secret message on the back of this sheet of paper mm. and reveal the message to you without turning the paper over? Watch very carefully. Are you ready? Mm. A one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six, and there it is, my secret message without turning the paper ah. over. How about that? In Red. slow motion, um. once more. Okay, ready? <laughs> one fold towards you, two folds towards you, one fold across, left to right, back, right to left, one fold up, two folds up, and that's how you make paper perform acrobatics. Mm. Short and incredibly sweet. Thank <laughs> you. Now, how do blind people read and write? Well, they don't use sight, they use touch and a system known as Braille. It's a combination of six raised dots and by learning the various combinations of these dots you can learn to read T-H-I-S and so on. And Braille has many interesting applications. This Monopoly board, for instance, with a plastic cover and raised Braille areas so that blind people can actually play the game. Or this tape measure, again with raised dots to tell you exactly where you are on it. Or spice jars so you can find your way around the kitchen. But the most often used form of braille is in the printed word. Now here is the lit little Oxford English dictionary as we know and love it, but in braille, because braille takes so, so much space, it takes not only these eight volumes here, but another eight besides. So, that's how blind people read. But how do blind people write? Well, one of the best people probably to show us exactly how is Mark Prowse from the Resource Centre at the RNIB. Mark, show us how. This is a good device for actually showing you. Like, what I've been doing here is writing with a, a stylus or a little spike, really, pushing dots downwards into the paper. The trouble with this system is that it means you have to do everything upside down so that when you turn the paper over, it will read correctly. And that says? And that says how. Oh. oh. But that must be very laborious, I would have thought, to do it manually. There are um, machines, aren't there? What's this one known as? Yes, this one's the Perkins Brailler. The advantage of this machine is that we can punch in all of the dots at the same time. So an H, we can hit the three keys at once. How? And it's coming out the right way up, of course. OK, lovely. I suppose the biggest change in the world, almost, in the last 20 years has been the introduction of computers. Now, how does a blind person read what's on the monitor? You can either use a Braille display like this one, little holes in the display here, and pins that are coming up and forming the Braille characters. Or you can have it read to you in a synthetic voice. Press IP to scan. <laughs> OK. Well, that links us down to the, uh, to the scanner. I've got a, a message here that I'm going to put into the scanner. I'll just open the lid and uh, close the lid now. And yeah. then do you want to read those characters? Right. Let's see what it says. Let's see. Oh, yes. Hello, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> nice or little else, message. Or we can have it spoken here. Hello, Carol. Right. Oh. Thank you very much. Now, what difference has this technology made? It means, for example, that it's very much easier and quicker to turn um, the printed word into Braille, um, which should mean more, more Braille material is available to us, actually. So you don't have to rely on the publishers anymore? No. Excellent. So. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Okay. And if you'd like to know more about Braille, or indeed about blindness itself, then send for this fact book to RNIB 224 Great Portland Street, London, W1N6AA. And that is how blind people can both read and write. How long is a foot, Fred? 12 inches. Mm -hmm. Carol? Uh, 30 centimetres in the modern system. Right. Good. Well, actually, there's more to it than that. Yes. I'm going to prove that your two feet measure 
the same. No, Our they feet are the don't. same. Do you want to put some money on that? Tempe yeah, in the kitty. Good idea. <laughs> now, the you'll need to what? measure your feet. I've prepared these foot rulers here. Yes. So, um, Fred, pass Thank it to you. Carol yes. and uh, measure your Thank foot for you. me, please, if you measure would. Measure our feet. Right, right. there's yeah. mine. Yeah. 11 inches. Right, not 12 inches, Mine's 11, uh, Carol. Uh, nine, uh, nine inches, 23 centimetres. 23 centimetres. So our feet aren't the same, that's uh, our uh, money. Uh, not so fast. Just wait there a moment. You see, the idea of the foot was first introduced to this country by the Romans, and they defined the foot as being the length of the emperor's foot. And here's an emperor's sandal. That was a Roman foot. But what happened when that emperor died and he was replaced by a man with smaller feet? Well, the measurement for a foot would change. That's no good. Confusion every few years. So another system was employed in this country years ago, where in villages of England, men would be lined up heel to toe, eight men, and the average length of their eight feet would be worked out to give an average foot. Now, I've done this with the Howe production team, lined them up heel to toe. Fred, grab that end for right me. Here. Right, eight people there, heel to toe. Now, to get the average feet, I need to fold it a few times. Right, that's see. one. Yeah, so four. that's four feet. That's two, two feet. feet. And that's a foot. That's a foot. And what's the length of the length an average of foot in the Howe village is approximately oh, 25 centimetres, short of the 30 work, of a standard. No, now, well, you see, there was problems with that system too. So eventually it was decided to give the foot a numbered measurement, to call it 12 inches, and there could be no argument about the length of a foot then. 12 inches, 30 centimetres. Yeah, but Lovely. you said that our, our feet, feet are the same. The same. Yeah, and they're uh -huh. not, so uh -huh. uh, not so fast, Fred. Feet on the table, OK? You want to try something? Feet Take, on yeah. the table. Feet yeah, on just the one. Table. Take your heel of your foot and Take stick it into your inner elbow there, like that, OK? Um, you will yeah. see that my big toe yeah. actually finishes right where my wrist starts, not that line of my wrist. Now, yeah. Fred, where does your big toe finish? My big toe also finishes by my wrist. The same as me, Carol. Yeah. Yes, so does mine. It finishes at my wrist. The same as me. And it's the same for you guys at home, too. The same. How long is a foot? Well, it's exactly the same as that distance from there to there. That's how long a foot is. All right, you win. Can I take my foot down now? Oh, go on, then. It's painful. <laughs> how many discs play music? I'll give you the answer before we start. Four discs play music. What are they? Well, records, final, yeah? Yes, I'll give you that. Yeah. Record, compact disc, one. compact disc, CD. Compact disc, yeah. yes. And computer two. floppy disc with music on them. Floppy disc with music on them, yeah. three. Uh, but what's like the fourth? Optical laser type no, discs. No, that comes under the heading of those two. 12 inch singles. No, no, mm. that comes under that as well. I tell you, you'll never get the answer to this how because the answer to this how lies 120 years in the past. And it is this. This beautiful Victorian music box made in Switzerland 120 years ago. And it sounds like this. Mm. Beautiful, isn't it? Mm. It is absolutely beautiful. But Fred, that is a cylinder. Yeah. It is not the fourth disc. You want to hear a Victorian disc? Yes. Yeah. I'll show you a Victorian disc. This is a Victorian disc, about 100 years old, and it plays in exactly the same way as the cylinder music box, with these tiny metal pins which pluck the teeth of the comb to produce that exquisite sound. Do you want to hear how it plays? Join me in Freddie's Victorian disco. <laughs> Hi there, pop pickers. Welcome to the Dinage Disco. Funky sounds from first time around from a different generation. The Linga Ling Polka. Yeah! Pop pickers, this is this week's number three. Moving up now from three to this week's number two, Gareth Jones's Granny. This is for you, the Merry Widow. And our pop pickers, this week's number one. The number one sound right across the UK. It's the pick of the pops. Not off. Ta-da! And that's how they made discs make music, even the Victorians. How can a pendulum save your life? Well, believe it or not, pendulums save millions of lives every day. And how? It's all got, how? Well, it's all got to do with the seatbelt, the inertia-real seatbelt, in fact. Now, you know, 
the inertia rail seat belt. It's the type of seat belt that moves out and back, allowing you to adjust your position in the car and allows you to get comfortable. And yet when it's required to hold you still, it jams and holds you safely in the car. But how does it work? What's that got to do with the pendulum? Ah, I'll explain. Now, to explain, I will need Fred, a yes. brick wall from you. This is the best <laughs> I can do, really. And I will need this baby walker fitted with a pendulum. Look, there's the pendulum hanging in this bowl. Now then, watch what happens if the baby walker or car moves smoothly. The pendulum swings, but doesn't touch the sides of the bowl. But if the baby walker were to come to an abrupt stop, the pendulum hits the side of the bowl. And that's exactly how an inertia reel seat belt works. If you look at the mechanism inside, you'll see it's exactly the same thing. Look, there's the pendulum swinging freely, and that's the side of the bowl. Now then, if the car moves smoothly, it swings without touching the side. But watch what happens if the pendulum, if the car comes to an abrupt halt, the pendulum swings right to the side, moving that lever there. Do you see that? Now that lever then jams that cog which stops the seat belt from moving and holds you safely in the car and stops you from being hurt in a crash. Now, to show you how important it is to wear a seat belt in the car, have a look at this crash involving not real people, but crash test dummies. Here comes the crash now, bang, into the wall. Let's have a look at that again in slow motion to see what happens. Now, of the passengers, that crash test dummy in the front is held down with the seat belt. In the crash, he's held still, but the child, unrestrained at the back, goes through the car and through the window. So, that's how important it is to wear a seat belt, and that's how pendulums save people's lives. How... How... No, for the first time ever on How, I'm going to get rather a special guest to introduce her own How. How do I, Lady Penelope, nod my head? Is that what you wish to know, Mr. Dynage? That is precisely the How, Lady Penelope, star, international star of Thunderbirds. May I say, first of all, though, what a great honour it is to have you here with us. It's super to be here, Freddy. May I call you Freddy? <laughs> you can call me anything you wish. You really can. I'm so excited. Um, so what about the How, then? May I ask you, how do you nod your head? Well, I think my manipulator, Christine Glanville, may have the answer. I'll be back in a moment. Just excuse me. Christine. What about this how, then? How does she nod her head, or how do you nod her head for her? Well, she's got three strings to the head. They're attached to the control here, here, and here. So that by moving the control about this way, that way, moves the head. You can move her eyes? Yes. This rocking thing here, which I've got my thumb through, moves the eyes. And you can move the arms and the legs? Yes. What about the strings? How did you disguise them? Well, we used to pour some stuff on called the anti-flare, then spray them with the applicable colour to the backing, and that made them disappear. To match the background? Yes. I wonder, thank you, could I have another word with her? Oh, certainly. Lady Penelope, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but I feel we have discovered an exciting new member of the international rescue team, FAB Toppers. F-A-B, Freddy. Thunderbirds a go, Lady P. Yeah. Well, here he is, F-A-B Toppers. I know he doesn't look much, but I knocked him up in my lunch hour. Now, let's see if he'll work. I've got his body and his head, Carol. Yeah. You've got his arms and his knees. Okay. Now, when I say jerk, jerk him up. OK, ready? One, One two, two, three, three jerk! jerk. Oh. Hey, not oh, bad so far. Yes. Now, let's... Christine said, waggle yeah. this one for the head. Yeah. yeah, let's get his body going. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Right, try his arms. Uh, Give him a good pull. Oh, good pull. Hey. Excellent. Get those knees going. Okay. One, two. That's the stuff. <laughs> Do you reckon we can make him work? Uh, come on, then, this way. Walking. Oh, oh. That's it. Oh, lovely, it. lovely. Oh, no. Twist it. Oh, He's too far from the wall. Get him back against that wall. <laughs> That's it. Oh. Lovely. That's better. That's oh. it. Okay, oh. Oh. Your control. Oh. Your control is fantastic. Oh, I know. Brilliant. Look at that. You wouldn't think he was a dummy, would you? Mm -hmm. Okay, then. Okay. Drop him. Oh, drop that's him. it. Well, that's how Lady Penelope nods her head. Jerk his right hand up. That's it. Get it up. Lovely. Because that's how for now. How? F-A-B, 
Freddy? 